Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so we'll continue with what we left off with a very quick and direct application of conservation of energy. We can talk about this qualitatively, and we can also set up equations to, to solve it. So let's pick up where we left off and first let's um, reasoning it, have some reasoning about this using a qualitative way. So there's a block, uh, it has a velocity V when it's at the bottom of the ramp. So you can think of the block has some kind of energy, right? It's the kinetic energy the block has. While it going up the ramp, the block would slow down, eventually come to rest. So that kinetic energy no longer exists at the end when it comes to the highest point. So where does that kinetic energy go? The kinetic energy of the block has transformed into a different format. And uh, what does it become? Potential energy. Potential energy of the block um, and the Earth system. Very good. It become the, the height. So you can think of this as a transformation between kinetic energy and potential energy. And there's no other type of energy involved. Uh, there's no friction, right? So there's no energy transfers into or out of the system. So if you wanna see if there's energy into the system, there has to be something to make the block go faster. Uh, and if there's friction, friction always is a, uh, a way to have energy transferred out of the system. Um, so, so obviously if you have something sliding on a, uh, a floor and if you have friction, then that energy will you know, eventually be lost and generate become uh, thermal energy becomes heat. But there is no such thing. So it's really just a transformation between kinetic energy and potential energy. So if the block has the same amount of kinetic energy to begin with, no matter where uh, what the ramp is, eventually it's going to have the same potential energy. So it will have the same MGH at the 40 degree ramp. It will have the same MGH at the 20 degree ramp because it all had uh, the same kinetic energy to begin with. So H prime is going to equal to H. It's gonna reach the same height. If you were to set up uh, equations to solve this qualitatively, you will say, okay, my system is my block and earth system. And uh, the initial energy <clears throat> of the system is simply only kinetic is one half mv squared. The final energy of the system, E final, is potential only, which is mgh. Okay, and there is no energy inputs or energy outputs. So we will set up energy equations. We will say E final minus E initial is equal to E in minus E out, right? That's the conservation of energy equation we talked about. The final is just MGH. Initial is one half MV squared and there's no transfer. So the right-hand side is zero. So you can solve for the height, which is related to the velocity, V squared over two G. So you can see that nowhere does the angle enter the equation. So no matter what the angle is, as long as they have the same V, it's going to reach the same height H. Okay, so that's how we can solve for this qualitative, quantitatively, but we know it has to be the same height. Let's take a look at uh, a demo that show, show us um, equal about equal height on the different uh, ramps. So let's take a look at this. Oops. Well, I had it opened here, so let's just take a look. Hello everyone, and welcome to another video presentation by the University of North Texas Physics Department, courtesy of the Physics Demo Room. Today we're gonna to be talking about is energy, and really the conversion between potential energy to kinetic energy. Now, this only talks about 
uh, are mechanical energy. It doesn't talk about chemical energy or elastic energy uh, at all. So with mechanical energy, we have that the kinetic energy and potential energy initially of a situation has to equal the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the final situation. This can be in collisions, or it can just be in an object moving. Now, a lot of times when you are experiencing this, you might actually see that kinetic energy is not conserved. Well, this is due to an outside force, and usually it results in that the work is equal to the change in our all right, so he gets to work. We're not there yet. Uh, I don't want you to just dis distract you from that. Uh, so basically, you can see there are two ramps here. On the one on your left hand side is the one that's a bigger degree. You can think of that as the 40 degree angle. The one that's on the right hand side is much less steep. So that's a uh, 20 degree angle. But they're all at the same height vertically. So he's going to demonstrate whether the ball could roll off one and about reach the same height to the other one. So let's see um, from here. Let's start here. As you can see, the first time we got relatively close to the original starting point. So let's do that one more time. Watch the ball. You can see that it's the height, uh, this height on the right-hand side, they reach about the same height on the left-hand side. It's not exactly equal because uh, this is still a real life demo. We, we're not 100% friction free. So we do have a little bit of friction, but you can see about the same height on each side. But obviously as you continue to roll the ball, eventually lose, uh, the kinetic energy due to friction and it's going lower and lower and lower each time all right so that's a really quick demo to show what we were trying to demonstrate with that problem you scroll again real quick uh i was looking at that equation like the oh yeah you wrote out that yeah, yeah. um what is uh what is in and out in and out again this is energy input into the system this is an energy output out of the system Oh, are they both, and that was equal to zero when you did it? Yes, it, they're both zeros, yeah. Okay. Were you going to ask why they were zero? Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask why. Uh, so there's no external force acting on the system. Usually uh, when you have, when you have, uh, like say a frictional force, intuitively, you know, that's going to take energy away from your system, right? Slow you down. So that would be considered an energy output. And if you have another, um, let's say you keep, you know, moving the block, you, you keep applying a force, well, you're making it go faster and faster. That would be considered a energy input. But we don't have any of that in this question. We don't have an external force that's to speed it up, and we don't have the friction to slow it down. So that's why our inputs and outputs are both zero here. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh, okay. And a lot of times our, uh, we talk about kinetic and potential together as the mechanical energy. So for example, here, uh, again, we have a cart rose without friction. Whenever you see without friction, um, you can know that there is no energy uh, input or output. It didn't really say that there is a force to speed it up, so there is no input. There's no output because there's no friction. Okay, so it gives us a graph of the gravitational potential energy, the potential energy PEG versus the position as is shown. You can see it is changing. But the total mechanical energy is 45. So the mechanical energy is the kinetic and the potential combined is 45 kilojoules. What is the maximum kinetic energy over the stretch of this track shown? So you can see that um, as we were showing earlier, when you have no friction, it's really just a transformation between kinetic and potential. You have a lot of kinetic, you will have very little potential, right? When you're going at the bottom of the ramp, you're all speed, but you're very low. 
when you go to the top of the ramp, you are all potential, but you have no kinetic because you have all the height, but you don't have any velocity. So it's really these two are kind of just, um, this one goes up, this one goes down, but they combined with the total energy does not change, remains a constant. Like that's what we showed earlier is EF minus EI is zero. So uh, energy remains a constant. In this case, the energy consists of the mechanical energy is a kinetic and potential is four to five kilojoules. Uh, we're not going to click. I just want to talk about this one. So let's take a look at this graph. Uh, so it's asking what is the maximum kinetic energy? So what would you try to look for from this graph? If, if you want to figure out the maximum kinetic energy. This is a graph about potential energy. Um, a maximum point in the graph. Uh, an extreme point in the graph, I agree. So do we want an extreme point of the maximum of a potential or the minimum of the potential in order to give the maximum kinetic? Well, the, when potential is equal to zero, um, we, that's when kinetic energy will be at the max. But when, kinetic, when potential energy is at its max, that means that kinetic will be at zero. So, um, but we, we never truly know if, oh, we do we know. Uh, yeah, I, I guess from this example, the max would be, um, the max kinetic energy, I think, would be 30. Okay, so uh, the maximum of the potential here is 30. The minimum of the potential is here is at 10. Okay, so that is the potential is minimum and maximum. Um, you're right, if one completely goes to zero, obviously all of that energy, 45 kilojoules, will go to the other type of energy. If, can, if potential energy completely goes to zero, then all 45 becomes kinetic. Um, but potential never really goes to zero. The smallest it can get, well, given the graph it's showing here, is 10, is 10 kilojoules. So what is the maximum of the kinetic we can have at the stretch, during the stretch that we're showing? The max you can have is 35 kilojoules because if you have 45 in the system, yeah, then you would have 10 for potential and 35 for kinetic. Yes, exactly. So uh, the maximum for the kinetic will be 35. So the total will still remain uh, 45 as a constant. Very good. So this is a quick really check up on showing how mechanical energy remains constant when you don't have energy transfers, inputs or outputs. There's a very, also a very type of classic problems where you have marble sort of go around loop for loop. Uh, it's kind of like the roller coaster problem. In fact, we will bring that roller coaster problem again to revisit it and we can solve it using the energy approach. Um, first, let's like, uh, take a look at, uh, I don't know why. okay, let's take a look at this demo. of a loop the loop uh, which you might encounter in some uh, amusement park rides etc etc in our stock room on the idea is you got a marble you want to start it on this track and you want it to get all the way around the loop the loop we'll do the theory part of it in class the experiment uh, is kind of fun and interesting to watch you start it too low clearly doesn't make it around the loop the loop. If you start it at the height, roughly the same height as the height of the loop. So any predictions, if it starts from that same height as the height of the loop, is it going to make it away all the way over? In a perfect world, I like without, without friction, I think it would, but okay. with friction, I don't think it will. Okay, all right, let's see. Loop. It also does not, make it all the way around. The reason is that if you start it here, conservation of energy says that whenever you get up to that same height, it's gonna have zero velocity because it had zero velocity when you released it here from rest. But you need it to, you need it to have some velocity. 
So he's saying that if you start on the same height, when you reach the same height inside the loop again, the velocity is zero. Does that make sense? So we talk about conservation of the mechanical energy remains a constant, right? If the marble in here, we, we make an, an ideal assumption that we are ignoring friction. So the best case scenario we can get is this is a minimum friction. So potential energy, kinetic energy will overall be a constant. So if you start out here, let's say uh, four to five kilojoules, and all of that is potential. Now, if you go all the way back to the same height, all of that energy is potential again, four to five kilojoules. So you definitely should not have any kinetic energy at the top. So the kinetic energy will be zero at the top. That's, that's simply conservation of energy that we would just talk about. And even in the perfect world, the marble would not make it over because we talked about in order for it to make it over, you need to have a velocity. So it, so it has that centripetal acceleration to turn the velocity, but not to make it fall down. You see, it doesn't have that velocity, it's going to fall down. So even in the perfect world, it's not going to make it. D and that velocity is the square root of G times R, G the acceleration of gravity. So it needs to be higher than that and we'll work out the math in class. But clearly if you're way up here and missed the track, sorry about that. Makes it all the way around and there's an intermediate spot here where it barely makes it around. I didn't quite make it there. And you saw in this particular case, um, I was pretty- So he's pretty close to that bare minimum critical point where barely make it over. Uh, it's a, you know, any smaller than that is going, is going to fall. So uh, we're going to solve that today to, uh, in class, of course. Um, this is like the loop -la loop You have this little cart here, but you can think of that's sim similar as the marble, you're treating this as a point particle, right? We're treating whatever object as a single point. And that point goes down from the height of a track and then goes all the way around the loop. So we are trying to figure out where is this critical point where you release it, it can barely make it over. Any height uh, lower than this, it's not going to make it over. So we wanna find the minimum height so what is the minimum height required for the ball not to fall off the track uh, at point B, which is the uh, highest point uh, within the loop? And the radius of the loop is five meters. And we, uh, as an idealization, we will ignore air resistance and friction. So this is tell us in the perfect world, this is the minimum height you need. Uh, you obviously, if you wanted to always make it over, you need to go always much higher than your minimum height to make sure it always uh, make it all the way around. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the strategies you might use to solve this problem. Um, if I want to find a height uh, using, here we're using a energy approach, right? Um, what kind of energy has a height involved? Is it kinetic or is it the potential? or is the elastic potential of the spring? We talked about those three types of energies. So if I want to talk about height or solve for the height, which energy should I have involved? Potential energy? Probably, yeah, we need to talk about the potential energy. And what is potential energy? Is, is it equal to, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. MGH, very good, mass of the marble times little g, the gravitational acceleration, little g, and the height. Here, implicitly, implicitly, but now we're going to write it out explicitly that we are treating our ground as our reference point. You don't always have to. You can choose halfway in between to be your reference, and that's okay. Um, but a lot of times we just say this zero potential at the, at, the, at the ground level, okay? 
So relative to the ground, uh, sorry, relative to the ground, you have an MGH uh, potential energy to begin with. So we're talking about, okay, conservation of energy. Uh, it looks like the energy transformation happening between the potential energy and the kinetic energy. So to solve for the potential, I need to relate it to kinetic. So I probably need to find out the kinetic energy at some other point and relate these two types of energy together. Uh, and in terms of solving for kinetic, what do I need to know? So if I know, the question is, uh, at what height when you release it, it's going to have, it's, no, it's going to not fall off at point B. So point B is an important point you are going to evaluate. You're evaluating two points, okay? And this is a, any physics problem is a process. During a process, you have two points, the beginning point and the end point. So when it begins is the height that you release from, that's point A. When it end is at point B, where you want it to not fall off at that point. So if I knew the velocity at point B, can I find out the height at point A? So can I make that claim saying, if I know the velocity at point B, I can solve for the height at point A. That part, would you agree? I think because uh, it's the same mass, the same gravity, the same everything else. So we could just eventually set them equal to each other. Yeah, we can plug them in to the conservation of energy equation and we should be able to solve it. Yes, so we are confident. So you can see before we solve a problem, we wanted to talk about it qualitatively. Uh, we have we need to have a strategy before we grab equation to use it. So it looks like we do have a strategy. What do we do? What do we want to do? We want to say, okay, if I can find the speed required at point B for it to not fall off, then I can convert that minimum speed required to the minimum height required at point A. Okay, so I sort of switch the problem to uh, a sort of a sub question. Let's find the speed first, and then we can find what the height is at point A. Um. We have solved this in the very end, little, very end of Newton's second law chapter. Uh, we have solved for the velocity you need at the highest point of the loop in order for the object not to fall off the track. Um, do you still remember how we did it? Any thoughts? Didn't we uh, use one of the um, the, the uh, centripetal acceleration um, equations? I think it was like b squared over r that we used, and then we figured out like the minimum velocity from that with the square root of uh, I think it was like r g or something like that. I don't know. I might be wrong. Yes, yes, very good. We, we realized for a, this, this is in the circular motion inside a loop and a centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So we are solving, we're trying to find this velocity here and we wanted to relate it to acceleration. And acceleration is also related to forces, right? So this is kinematics quantities. But when we do dynamics, uh, acceleration is F equals MA. So acceleration can relate the forces to the other kinematic quantities. So we wanted to find out some more information about the forces. So if I know the forces at point B, I can find the acceleration at point B, and then I can find the velocity at point B, and eventually I can find the height at point A. So this is 
we have a strategy now at play. So when the ball is barely making it over the track, it's just about to fall off. How do you draw the free body diagram? When it's just barely going over, just barely, that's a critical point. Which one of these is a correct free body diagram? Um, it may be, it's a slightly different than the one question we did in the dynamics one, because now I'm asking about the critical point. Um, so feel free to take a minute to think about it. And if you're ready, you could put in your vote in the poll question, okay? All right, uh, let's go for another 10 seconds if you haven't voted already, 10 more seconds. All right, any last minute vote? Okay, let's uh, close this and we'll take a look. Okay, so C has the majority of the vote and C was indeed the correct answer for our question where we asked about this in dynamics. Um, what was different there? There was, the question was asking about uh, what is a free ride diagram when you're at the highest point of the loop for a roller coaster or treating it as a point model, point particle model, right? So, um, so the two forces, uh, what do we label it as the force of gravity, and the other one is normal force from the track. Very good, the track is pushing on you uh, downward. Both of these will be combined to, to be the, provide the centripetal force uh, that you need. And now what is different? Is the question slightly changed? The question right now is not asking about a normal situation when you did make it over, it's asking a critical point where you're barely making it over. So what happens to normal force when you're barely making it over? Normal force is like essentially zero, zero. It's essentially zero. Because if you have a normal force, you're totally making it over. Like this is just like a scraping, touching the surface, but not even going to, you're not even pushing up at all, just touching the surface and going down. So normal force is zero. So we should uh, not draw this normal force in our, uh, in our free body diagram. So it's really just gravity uh, going down. That's providing gravity entirely provides centripetal force in this case. So D. Now, now having gravity, we can go back to solve for the minimum speed required. Here at this point, uh, you have one force acting on it. 
and one force only, that's gravity. Okay, so let's set up Newton's second law. The sub part of this problem, I'm using a dynamics approach. Uh, and I'm applying Newton's second law on the object, F equals MA. Uh, and F, the net force is gravity only because I'm looking at a critical point, right? So minimum speed, when it's barely making it over, you have only gravity. And you have M and you have acceleration. The centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. V is the speed at point B. And that's the minimum speed you are looking for. Uh, so, so you can set up your uh, MG on the left-hand side is equal to M V B squared over R. So we calculated V B at the top. This is a minimum required is equal to what? Is equal to square root of G times R. G times R. Okay. So we found our minimum speed. Now we can go back and solve for the minimum height required at point A. So before we go uh, move on to talk about the height and solve for the height, any questions about how we found the minimum speed? Um, I'm just a little bit confused on why the normal force would be zero for this particular problem. For the minimum speed, meaning that any speed lower than this, it's definitely going to fall out. Um, it's minimum speed required for it to barely make it over. So when you're saying it's barely, uh, when you fall off, you can think about, okay, normally the ball is touching the track, but when it's falling off, it's no longer touching the track. So if it's not touching the track, then normal force would be zero. Does that make sense? Okay, right, because um, because gravity is kind of pulling it down. So then that's when normal force wouldn't be acting on it anymore. And gravity, yes, but if you have enough speed, it's okay to still have gravity because gravity is now combined with the normal force provide the centripetal force simply just turning it, uh, make you curve, make you turn. But when your speed is not fast enough, uh, yes, then, then this object would just kind of fall, um, yeah, due to gravity. Thank you. Fall off means lose contact with the track. So if you lost contact, obviously, you will not have normal force. And very good, very good. That's important, important question. Okay, so now let's go try to solve for the original question, which is the minimum height. But now we know VB is GR, okay? So to find the minimum height, we found the minimum speed required at this point is GR. We need to set up uh, conservation of energy so we say, okay, the physics involved is not, we have used Newton's laws already. Now, another physics we're going to use is the conservation of energy principle. Conservation of energy says E final minus E initial is equal to E input minus E output. Okay, so um, I will give you a little bit of time to think about and try to write down your system and all of these different terms, um, including the final energy of the system, uh, initial energy of the system, and the energy transfers. That's the energy input and energy output. So all of these different terms. Um, so take a, okay, well, you can take a screenshot knowing that these are what you need to find. And this is our question. So take a screenshot of the question uh, and we'll have a discussion for a um, couple minutes in the breakout room. And when we come back, we can check on uh, what we found, okay? So um, make sure that you recorded the question before you go.
is our E final like at the point B or is it at, at what point is P E final at? Uh, that's what for you to decide what which point during the process you wanted to define as your final point. Okay. To figure out, yeah, what is initial and what is final? Very good question. Hi everyone, how's it going here? Uh, we can have a discussion here. You don't have to already figure out the answer. We can simply just talk about it. So to calculate the final question, uh, what do you wanna choose to be your system where you apply conservation of energy to it? For the system, were we just supposed to be using them like in terms of, so like A would be the system or B would be like just by using the letters since it doesn't, since the only number that it actually gives us is the. Yeah, A and time. B would be, you can identify as points, initial state, final state. So yeah, we can add like, what is your initial point? What is your final point? So system is, um, is what is your object you're interested in? So are you interested in the, in the track? Are you interested in a rock? Are you interested in a ball? Like what is the object you wanted to analyze? So that's what I mean by system, okay? Okay. So what would you be, what did you wanna to choose to be your system? cart that's moving yeah the car that's moving or the ball if it's a marble so we're just going to say this is the ball um and since we we know previously we probably will include um potential energy in our calculation so i'm just going to say a ball and earth because the potential energy technically belongs to both of them so just say the ball is not accurate enough so it's ball and the earth system together very good and you are talking about point A and B. So any of those points you want to be assigned as your initial point? A. Point A, very good. B would be the final point, very good. So at point A, which is your initial, what kind of energy, E initial means initial energy, what kind of energy your system has at that point? Um, it's letting you let it go. It doesn't really have a velocity. You just let it go. Okay, so what kind of energy your system has at that point? Potential. Potential, very good. Um, thank you, Justin, as well. So it would just be potential. H at height A. And what kind of energy your system has at point B? That's your defined to be final point. At point B, what do we have? Also potential, very good. The point B has potential and it's mg. The height of B, the height of B is the diameter of the track, which is 2R, different now, okay? And is there anything else at point B? 
Do we have any other energy at point B? We have potential. We have, yes, a velocity. So we have kinetic too, right? It is moving with certain speed. Uh, and we just found the speed. So now we have uh, these two are zeros. We talked about them earlier. And we can set them up into our equation and we will be able to solve it. All right, so that one, let's finish it uh, with everybody together. Um, so I'll see you guys in a little bit, okay? All right, okay, so let's take a quick look and solve this together. Uh, do you, with your discussion, what do you wanna to choose to be your system? Meaning what object or objects that you're interested in? Uh, ball on the earth. The ball, very good. It's certainly we're not interested in the track. We're not interested in some other random ground. We're interested in the ball, that's one that's moving. Uh, and very good, we add Earth to be accurate because we know that we want to use potential energy. Uh, so we have to add Earth into the system. And what would be your initial point? This is a physics process. Which point is your initial point you're trying to evaluate? Point A. Point A and your final point B? B. B, why don't we choose C to be our final point? Because we want to, we want the ball, the we want the ball to have a velocity that like allows it to continue going at B, and we don't really care about C because we know once it gets to C, it'll be fine. Yeah, very good, very good. We know information. Information we're trying to evaluate is to make it over at point B. Very good. So, what kind of energy the system has at initial point at point A? What kind of system? What kind of energy your system has? All potential. All potential, very good, because it's not moving, you're just releasing it. So it's MGH, H is the one you wanted to solve. And what kind of energy your system has at the final point, which is point B? Kinetic and potential. Ah, kinetic and potential, very good. We didn't, don't forget about that potential because it's still at a height above the ground. And then kinetic is also important because we have established, it does have a velocity there. Um, it's not zero velocity there. And the potential need MGH. So what kind of height should I put for point B? Two R. Two R, very good. The diameter of the track. Very good. So now we have all of these we need. Uh, we have established there's no friction, so no output. You don't have an external force that to make it speed up, so there's no energy input. Uh, let's plug in these terms into our equation. E final minus E initial, so it becomes E final is, is this, right? Minus E initial is this, is equal to in and minus out, zero minus zero, so zero. Okay, so quickly, let's cancel the M. We don't really need the M. And we want to solve for a height. Okay, so 
it looks like um, one half V squared plus two R uh, is equal to G H. And V we had just solved, V is a uh, square root of GR. So it becomes one half GR plus two uh, GR, this is another G, two GR equals GH. Again, we can cancel our G. Um, and our height would just be one half R plus two R is five R over two. So you need to go um, five R over two to make it over you need to go more than the diameter more than twice of the diameter to make it over okay? where, where do we get the two r in e uh, final where do i get this two? Oh, this two comes uh, oh, oh. I, meant, I, I meant like for the energy the final on top like you got two r right there where did you get that oh uh, because this is a radius this is this is a diameter this is a height. Oh, oh, okay. I see. That's I see. Yeah. Two R. Um, yeah. So we converted that two R into the height at point B here. Okay. So that's uh, we have solved this marble problem, right? It takes a little long, but I hope the process is is clear. The conservation of energy law is a powerful view of the universe. It applies on every scale, from a big cosmological scale to your everyday life scale to very, very small and tiny microscopic scale and applies everywhere. And I've talked about this a little bit already. The conservation of mass uh, is simply, the mass cannot be created, destroyed. It's simply uh, going from somewhere to one way to another, right? You can be, have a solid become liquid, but um, the total mass remains constant. Conservation of charge is something you might uh, will learn in 1520. Uh, you may not go through the derivation, but you probably will hear about the notion of conservation of charge in that class. Uh, conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum is what we will do in this class. Uh, this is where we are right now. Um, in terms of particle physics, if you're looking at this microscopic uh, level, the conservation of ion numbers, lepton numbers is uh, also a universal law of nature. So it's a very powerful tool and importance. You can see the importance of the conservation law we are learning here um, in our class. So, so far, the problem we have been solving about is uh, we just don't have any inputs or output. So the equation becomes simple. The right-hand side is zero, okay? And uh, let's do another example problem real quick. Uh, is also a conservation of energy problem without any energy inputs, um, but involves the elastic spring. So we haven't done the potential energy, the other form of potential energy. So let's do this one. So we have a spring constant K, the spring, uh, a maximum length of compression is D, which means it, this is D, right? This is D, is, uh, and mass of the block is M. Assume no friction, find the velocity of block at point O. Okay, so this is what we will do. The system will be, well, you're asking about the block, you must be interested about the block. So my system is a block and there's a spring in it. So I wanna include my spring as well. Uh, my initial point, well, initially you launch the block from point X. So I'm just gonna say X. Finally, you wanna see what the block's velocity at point O. So I'm gonna pick my final point at point O. So your initial uh, energy, so the block is maxly compressed, so it's not moving at point X. So it's really just elastic um, energy. So one half K delta X squared. Finally, when the block is at point O, uh, you have kinetic energy of the block. This is a velocity you wanna find but we don't have any spring energy because at point O, the spring is relaxed. It's neither compressed or stretched. Inputs is zero, output is zero. Because there's no friction, there's no output. There's no input because there's no driving force. The, the spring and the block is going on its own. So quickly put it into our energy equations, you will find, okay, the final is all kinetic, the initial is all potential. So see, you can see this is a transformation between kinetic 
energy and elastic potential energy, back and forth, back and forth. And um, you want to solve for velocity. And I quickly solved the velocity is um, velocity squared is equal to k over m delta x squared. So velocity is square root of k over m times delta x, which is a maximum compression. Uh, it was telling us is d. Okay, so that's uh, that is the velocity of the block at point O. We did this relatively quick, but you can review it in a lot more detail later after class. And we will go back. We will definitely see more uh, energy conservation problems coming up. In fact, um, starting next week, we will talk about, OK, well, what if you do have energy transfer? Uh, we do have some inputs or output. Uh, how do we put it together to solve for uh, conservation of energy? Um, and we will talk about how we can have an energy transfer through doing work on the system. Okay, so that's a new concept we'll introduce. And then we will be able to do the inputs and outputs. Uh, so that solves a more variety of problems than we are um, currently doing. All right, that's all for today. I will see you guys next Monday. Uh, I want to announce that we have no class meeting on Wednesday because that's a exam day. Um, uh, and I will hope you have a good weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye, everyone. Bye, Professor. See you later. See you. Bye-bye.